Up next from DDN is James Coomer. He's going to present optimizing data systems for AI applications. James, how are you? Hello. Hello. Nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Right. Uh, so I thought I'd um, essentially take the audience through kind of a little journey through where DDN have been. Um, and by way of that, we'll look at the various sort of things that are kind of different if people are familiar with HPC thing that are different from the HPC environments. So the experiences we've had, the various relationships we've been having with uh, different AI vendors and basically what's resulted from that. Um, so I've used a bunch of slides we use sometimes to sell to customers. Sometimes they're internal training slides. I've com combined them together in not particularly neat way, um, but I thought this audience wouldn't mind with a bit of rough and ready stuff. But I will say, excuse me for the marketing slides that are in here, but I'll talk reasonably technically on top of them. <laughs> So firstly, I guess we should always set the case when we're presenting. Um, and there's a lot of truth in this slide. Uh, I guess it shouldn't really surprise many people, but um, as a company, we've seen um, a really dramatic uh, take up with customers we've never met before, who all of a sudden have very critical use and need for AI. Um, so that's been um, in sort of commercial sector, autonomous driving is a big one, uh, life sciences, financial analytics in particular. So it's quite fun in financial analytic analytics. There is a, a big race at the moment to deploy NLP models at really large scales to try and uh, um, predict pricing, um, which is obviously quite a fun area for people doing machine learning. Uh, and then on the other side, we've got people, uh, customers who are doing this for COVID research and that kind of stuff. But it's it's obviously got huge returns, um, but it requires very, very big investments. And those investments are really not generally thought about is storage. But people think about these things, the data sources, where do I get the data from? How do I ingest it into the system? Is there an ingest challenge there? Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. Then the big one, data scientists. I think we've had conferences where people have just talked about data scientists and how to get them and how to train them and how to keep them up to date and how to keep them conforming. Um, uh, data scientists and managing those and keeping them productive is pretty hard. The data processing, of course, that's pretty much top of most people's minds is all those GPUs or IPUs are going to use to process that stuff. And then more and more, of course, particularly in finance, particularly in life sciences and autonomous driving and those big three sectors, um, governance is big. In finance, it's big because the, the usually the national law says you must have strong governance over why you did what you did. Um, and in autonomous driving, you must have strong governance to prove uh, that your car has been well-trained uh, in order to see all the things that might be on the street that might cause an accident. Um, so there's all good reasons for governance. And it means many, many things, of course, is a very, very big topic. But essentially, people think about those things, data sources, data scientists, data processing, and data governments. And often what they don't think about is the data itself, uh, the, the storage at the heart of this stuff. Um, now, let me talk a little bit more about this, this cycle. I'll come back to it later. But in terms of data sources, we do have customers who have um, an ingest problem, which is super lumpy. So they've got big wads of data coming in abruptly, and all of a sudden they've got to get a few hundred terabytes from this thing over here into this thing over here. So they can start doing things. So on one end of the spectrum, we've got these lumpy problems. On the other end of the spectrum, things like NLP, you may have... Um, tens of thousands of relatively small streams coming in uh, to your AI infrastructure. Um, and they're constant, they're real time, they've got to be applied, have an inference applied to them real time and everything in between. So this data ingest problem is, is a genuine one, even though it's not often thought about too much. Uh, we tend to think about the read problems of, of training and, and inference. <laughs> 
Uh, so we have been doing a lot of work, as I borrowed some sort of marketing slides, but we're doing some work. The most work we've done, because I've been around here for a long time, was with NVIDIA. Um, but we have also been doing work with uh, various other um, new up-and-coming uh, vendors doing IPUs and various novel technologies um, like GraphCore, Sambanova, et cetera. Um, but the biggest experience we got and certainly the biggest scales with NVIDIA, um, we started this about three years ago um, with a system in Celine, which is fairly well advertised out there. I think it's number five on the top uh, 500 list today. Um, we shipped those systems out. I think it was about three years ago. Uh, they got around 14 petabytes of, of flash. And this is a system that NVIDIA and ourselves have been using to prove out um, how to deploy at these large scales. And the nice thing about this system is it's, it's in genuine use. It really is used to execute in production um, very major customer challenges, um, really the biggest challenges are out there. Um, so it's obviously Mellanox networking. It's um, using the sort of DGX A100s and it's using uh, DDN's uh, A3i system. So A3i is the kind of marketing brand we put around these optimized systems for, for AI. Um, so that's, that's one of number one. And I'll talk about the, the kind of fruits of this work um, with NVIDIA um, in a few slides time. So following on from this, though, you know, essentially what, what we get out of this is, you know, how to plug things in, how to make sure you don't uh, hit some obvious challenges. You know, in the first few few months of setting this stuff up, we kind of resolve the simpler challenges, making sure the network's clean, making sure everything's running optimally. And then we went down a few more sort of rabbit holes trying to solve other problems. Uh, but in the meantime, we deployed a bunch of other systems. Um, one at Cambridge One in the UK was put into production uh, maybe four or five months ago. Uh, pretty large system designated to healthcare, um, shared amongst many different uh, healthcare vendors. Um, uh, and that one uses multi-tenancy, which we'll come back to in a little bit. Uh, and then Recursion, um, another pretty large super pod system. Um, Recursion's actually a fun company to look at. They really pioneered, I think I would say, the application of AI into drug discovery. Um, so uh, it's a commercial operation based in the United States, and they've got very large NVIDIA-based systems, and they're really trying to accelerate the, the path to discovering drugs quicker using AI in various, various ways to, uh, to do that. And there's many more. There's about 20 more of these sort of super pods, and they've each got slightly different requirements and stuff like that. So during this sort of process of deploying these systems, I say there's probably maybe about 20 super pods out there with DDN storage behind them. And there's obviously many smaller, smaller ones. We tend to go, get, come across these sorts of issues with customers. Um, so often they will, and I'm talking about mainly commercial customers. I mean, in academia, people tend to be a bit more savvy about high performance storage and what that means. Um, but sometimes in the commercial world, they're coming from traditional IT, they're expanding into a POC. And, you know, sometimes they've got a very savvy research division that will do this right. Sometimes they haven't. And, um, sometimes a difficult route. But these typically tend to be these things. It's all very high level, but, you know, typically there's complaints that my existing system has jobs going slow or there's intermittent failures and I can't work out where the source is. Is it in the application world? Is it in the compute world? Is it in the network world? Or is it in the, in the, even in the storage world? Um, these ingest problems, we'll come back to those later, but ingest is a, is a challenge for many of our customers. Um, interfaces, often they'll start off, and quite a lot of these customers, by the way, especially in the commercial world, they've, they've really come from a big data world. Uh, they've been using Hadoop kind of infrastructures and then moving on to Spark. And now it's a natural progression to try and implement machine learning into that same kind of infrastructure for things like fraud detection, things like consumer preference analysis. Um, so it's um, uh, coping with legacy interfaces and basically enabling old applications and modern applications to work simultaneously on these systems has been a challenge. Uh, siloization of data, that's actually the big one. Um, so even though we are all very familiar with file systems that can scale to tens of petabytes, if not hundreds, and even terabytes per second, uh, those aren't very commonly known out there in, in the enterprise world. And they have, do generally have uh, lots of siloed data. So NAS systems all around the, the world, and all of a sudden they find that this wonderful data they've got is not easily accessible, and they can't really apply to compute to it um, very easily. 
And then, you know, so often this is this kind of an amalgamation of kind of complaints we've had from um, um, uh, potential customers who have been coming to us uh, for some, some assistance with uh, deploying uh, new systems. Uh, so this AI end-to-end -end data lifecycle is actually extremely complicated. If I drew the full picture, A, it would change, depend on who we're talking about, uh, which use case, um, uh, and B, even if I didn't do that, I could add a bit, about 20 more phases into here. But roughly, you're going to acquire the data, you're going to ingest it. Number two, you're going to tag that data, you're going to clean that data, you're going to transform some of that data to the right appropriate form. Um, you're going to add lots of tags, as I say, metadata labels. Um, in autonomous driving, the obvious thing is, you know, you get, you're basically getting in video streams and LIDAR and radar streams, and that's tagged with labels telling you what's in there. Um, so hopefully you'll know whether it's a cloudy day, sunny day, which city it was. Um, maybe it's got 15 cats on the road through the, through the whole process. You want some labels in there, um, and the labels are going to help you um, manage your governance and make sure you're um, bringing back the right data sets to retrain your models um, later on. Then, of course, step three is the training process, the deep learning process itself, mass and mass of data. Um, the more, the better. Uh, and then, of course, you're going to move into production, and then there's probably going to be some kind of sort of long-term sort of storage phase. It's never quite the same as HPC. In HPC, there has been a tendency to, uh, you know, you finish your project, the data goes into a, um, an archive, sits in a tape library, and uh, nobody ever touches it again. Um, but most often in AI, that data still remains very valuable um, because, you know, even though you might get new data, you probably want to also aggregate the old data and when you're, when you're training your new models. Um, so it tends to be that that sort of step five there is not the kind of archive you see in HPC. It's got to be a very active online, near line kind of, uh, but low cost um, area of storage. It needs to be low cost because... Uh, there is, again, often a bit of an unknown in these customers. They start at a POC, they move to production, and they honestly don't generally know whether they're going to need in the future lots of IOPS, and they're going to need lots of throughput, they're going to need lots of capacity, and the ratios of those things often isn't known on day one. But um, we do have customers which have, you know, um, half an exabyte in their systems, 500 petabytes of, of data can quickly uh, ramp up. Um, uh, particularly, that we see that particularly in you know anywhere that, where there's video um, and, and video inferencing, then those video files can get very big and, and mount up a lot. Uh, so, what does storage do for all these things? Uh, it's all very well having a little pipeline. Um, so I'll kind of try to demarketize this, but essentially when you're acquiring the storage is going to be having to go to do right performance and it's going to do right performance to, to accept different sorts of um, acquisitions. As I said, it might be very lumpy. Um, you might have a vehicle arriving at your depot and wanting to dump um, 200 terabytes out of its boot into your machine learning system. And the longer you spend moving that 200 terabytes in, the less time that vehicle is doing anything useful. Um, or it might be a microscope. Um, again, these uh, imaging systems, uh, gene sequencing systems are, are pushing out more and more data. It's getting quite significant now, the amount of data they push out. Um, uh, and it might be NLP or um, audio streams or whatever. Uh, secondly, the processing, uh, that's rather difficult. I talk about IOPS here, but um, uh, really it's about metadata, metadata tagging, integration with often databases. Um, uh, there's, there's often you know, a metadata database um, associated with an object store or a, or a file system here. In training, I'll talk about that quite a lot, both training and production, the inference stage. Um, there's lots of optimizations we've done and can be done to really integrate storage into this AI environment. And when I talk about this AI environment, I mean, A, the GPUs themselves, B, 
the sorts of I.O. that performed by the AI frameworks, B, the host systems, which have those GPUs in the architecture of those, the NUMA nature of those, then uh, D, the networks uh, are quite different often, um, especially from a client perspective in these environments. So there's lots of optimizations a storage system can do to do a better job when presented with this kind of different space you have there. And then in terms of sort of step five over here, then, the big thing is to have some kind of flexible way of delivering both performance and reasonably cost-effective large capacity, which might go into hundreds of, of terabyte, petabytes. So that's a bit of a preamble there. Um, a couple more slides just to point out sort of reasonably the size of some of these systems, typical ones. Um, this isn't a particularly large one, but it's an example of a, a super pod um, running D DGXs with A100s. As I say, we uh, I shouldn't say repeat the NVIDIA too much. We do have relationships with, with GraphCore and Sambanova. Um, and um, uh, three of the other um, up and coming um, IPU and GPU vendors. Um, but here you can get an idea of the sort of scale of typical systems we're deploying. Um, this is, I thought I put a couple of graphs in here because people like graphs. Uh, here's a graph we ran, um, I think it was about a year ago, actually, uh, on 128 DGX systems um, using 10 of our systems. I'll show you a picture of what our systems look like, but it's 10 storage systems. These are actually small. These are two rack units high, so they're pretty small. So it's like half a rack, I suppose. Um, and it's delivering about 500 gigabytes a second um, to these uh, DGXs and around 350 gigabytes a second. But this graph, I think the nice thing is it's really showing you we're actually testing this stuff against quite large numbers of these um, GPU systems. And the GPU systems themselves, as I said, um, they're not normal in terms of you know, standard HPC computers. Um, they're fat nodes, if you like. Um, they're fat in terms of the fact they've got an awful lot of GPU power in there. Um, they're fat in terms of their being data hungry, and they're particularly fat in terms of their network interfaces. Um, here you can see this uh, system here has actually 10 separate um, ConnectX6 cards connected onto the InfiniBand network, which is rather a lot of I.O., um, and then it's got these two sort of CPUs and then associated with the CPUs are a bunch of GPUs. So there's a NUMA nature internally inside this system. There's many, many network interfaces. Um, and what's more, we're running on containers, generally speaking. I'll give you an exception later on, but typically running containers. So that's very different from HPC where you're running a batch job. It runs on bare metal. You've got one interface, typically at one InfiniBand interface. Um, uh, and that's it. You got a bit of numinous, maybe, um, but you haven't got this other problem here. So the, the client perspective is rather different from from HPC. Um, and the network is also complicated. As I say it's particularly complicated from the client perspective because there's um, um, often many many. Um, links onto the network from each one of the systems. But generally, these systems have to be scalable and big. This is a very typical kind of factory-ish kind of infrastructure, but we've done lots, lots of work here. So step one is how do we make this simpler? Well, it's by doing this stuff, actually building it, working out what works, and then publishing all that stuff. Um, so really, my point, point number one in, in how do we architect AI systems is we actually build them and then we write down what we did and how to do it and how to repeat it. Um, and you'll see all these performance briefs and pod RAs and super pod reference architectures from both ourselves and, and NVIDIA. Um, and some of them have got rather a lot of detail, so they really prescribe um, through a lot of detail um, how to set these things up, which um, in, in AI, say, so because the the initial investment is so large and the investments in data scientists and the data itself is so large, then it kind of makes sense to take a shortcut when it comes to getting an architecture you know is going to work. Um, so there's been a lot of work just doing that. Um, as a, here's, a, here's the advert for, this, for the system. So this is a, a pretty new system. We launched this in um, October last year, something like that. Uh, there's three of them there. Uh, we put three of them in there, so I could say um, 10 million IOPS and get some nice round numbers. So each one does about 3.5 million IOPS, actually. Um, each one does about 90 gigabytes a second. So three of them, um, you're going to be doing uh, uh, 270 uh, gigabytes a second, over a quarter of a terabyte a second. You can get a petabyte of flash in there. 
Um, and it's all a file system. That's a complete file system here. So when you go to DDN and you ask for an AI system, you'll get something like this. It's a complete file system, metadata, management services, OSSs, everything's inside those systems. You can have one, you can have two, um, you can have 40 or more. Um, and of course, it is a parallel file system uh, based upon Lustre at its core. And so we get the nice linear scaling benefits from that. Um, I wasn't going to talk about that much, but this is essentially the system we're pretty much running all these other tests on, um, more or less in the, in the rest of the presentation. So things we've done. Um, so number one thing, we did this a long time ago now, um, was implement GPU direct storage. Uh, there's been quite a lot of fanfare about GPU direct storage, and it is, of course, a useful thing to do. We've been doing RDMA in the HPC world for a long time. What this does is extend that RDMA path direct to the GPU memory. Um, and it's kind of important because in these systems, let's say this is another um, NVIDIA system here, there's two CPUs and eight GPUs. Um, and for some workloads, the CPU can become um, a bottleneck before the GPUs are saturated, which is not what you want. Um, so by using this uh, GPU direct storage, you can relieve um, yourself from that problem. You can also get very high throughputs um, with this system. So we, in our reference architecture, we got to something like 162 gigabytes per second into one system, into one NVIDIA system. But the cool thing is, um, you know, you just install um, the Exascaler client and you get it. There's no more messing around. And I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, but it's a huge amount of, of data to try and push into one operating system. And it's not really the critical thing. The critical thing is more like how do you how do you manage that when it's a random read MMAP kind of workload? Um, there's no point in just pushing data um, in large streams into a, into DGX because that's not what the applications are going to do. They're generally going to do um, fairly, I mean, it varies, but often going to do fairly large chunks of memory map, and they're going to do that relatively randomly across a reasonably large data set. And then it's going to often repeat that for deep learning exercises. So the first thing we do with this, and as I said, we did this about a year and a half, two years ago, and now this is all GA and fairly standard stuff. The second thing we did, which people often overlook, um, but took quite a lot of work, is, you know, there is a lot of memory map going on, a lot of MMAP calls. So this is a particular call in POSIX. Um, um, so often HPC codes don't use MMAP. Often they do, so you see file opens and file reads, um, this kind of stuff, those kind of POSIX calls. Um, but analytics tends to MMAP in big chunks uh, directly into memory and plow, plow through that stuff. Um, uh, it tends to be random and it does benefit from intelligent prefetching. Um, the graph there is showing you, again, that was maybe 18 months ago we did that stuff. Um, we, basically, the orange line is the improvements we implemented uh, to speed up this MMAP call. And this is really important because, you know, there's no point in buying a, a storage system that says it does 100 gigabytes a second if your application can't get anything like it. Um, and it's just this kind of um, optimization that makes a difference for actual end users. End users go, oh, my application went faster um, when I got this new storage, which is the, critical, the, the best thing we want to hear is, is users saying that kind of stuff. And as I say, it's not necessarily the case. And we spend quite a long time explaining to customers that you know, buying a 100 um, gigabyte a second system or a one terabyte a second system might make your applications go slower because it might not actually work with the particular IO types you've got um, unless they've been particularly optimized for those. So this is called dynamic read ahead. Um, we've got various models. It's pretty intelligent stuff uh, to allow us to intelligently prefetch um, MMAP data into these clients. And that's been very, very critical to getting these strong sort of uh, AI framework results that we've published in those reference architectures. Uh, the other thing we did a while back um, was... Uh, uh, multi-rail. Uh, we've had it for a while, uh, but we made it quite a lot easier because, um, uh, again, many of these customers don't want to spend lots of time messing around. Um, so uh, now the, the Exascaler client, when you install it on these EasyX systems, it kind of knows where it is. 
um, and it knows which uh, network connections we well, you tell it which network connections it can use. And then it's going to round robin across those, but in a really quite nice, simple way. So the nice thing about a parallel file system versus, let's say, NFS, is you're not messing around with all these IP addresses and trying to configure them and, and mess around. It's a lot simpler than that. So even though you don't normally think of a parallel file system client as being a simple thing to manage, when it comes to these complicated client systems, um, it's a lot simpler to manage a parallel file system client than it is getting performance out of, out of NFS. So essentially what we've done here is a fairly short story, um, lots of details inside it, but um, we can just deploy the Xscaler client, start it up on these kind of systems and easily get the performance out of multiple network interfaces. And as I said, we've, we've got, you know, in our labs, we've got very close to 200 gigabytes a second into these systems, um, um, unnecessarily a large amount of throughput. More recently, uh, this happened over the past a year or so, uh, we implemented hot nodes. Uh, hot nodes is uh, a method of utilizing the NVMe drives inside the compute systems. They could be NVIDIA's, they could be any other system, of course. Um, we have been working closely with NVIDIA for this one in particular, though, because they had a, a particular need for it. Um, so what's happening here is, um, there's a bit of a detailed view. Um, the application will... Um, uh, make a request to open a file, and essentially our client is going to check whether that file is available on the local set of NVMe SSDs inside the compute system, or if it has to go out across the network and get it from the parallel file system. Um, so what we do with hot nodes is you switch on, uh, and then we've got a, a bit of intelligence running on the compute side. You'll start reading your data, um, and we'll stick it in the in the local NVMEs. And if you reread that data, then we'll just give it back to you straight from the local NVME devices. So essentially, there's a bit of speed up here, but it's a bit more of whole system efficiency. So you're moving it out and getting rid of any unnecessary rereads going across the network. Um, it's actually been pretty cool. So in video, we're getting... It's quite funny, it's not huge numbers, but a few percent um, increases in total environment throughput. But that's very important. If you've got like a, you know, a multi-million pound data center and this one feature gives you a few, a few percent um, improvement on the total job throughput for that, that's a really big thing. So we're not talking about kind of a, a micro feature here. Um, it really has a big impact on a, whole, on a very, very large environment. Here's a little graph that actually NVIDIA provided us um, uh, after we gave them this code. Um, it's a little bit complicated, actually, but uh, kind of fun to talk to. I know everybody likes graphs, so let's look at the top one. Um, what we're doing here is multi-epoch training um, without hot nodes at the top there. So what you're going to do is you're going to plot along, and your job's going to start um, a, a deep learning phase on a data set, data set A, and it's going to... Um, start up and it's going to call all this data across the network. So that's the net, the purple sort of lump there. And then it's going to get through that phase and then it's going to start the next phase, which is you know actually reading the same data and it's going to go and read all the same data from the network over again. Uh, so that obviously isn't ideal. So when you switch on hot nodes, what you get is a thing at the bottom, which looks a bit complicated, but effectively what's happening is in that first phase, you're reading um, from the network as you were before, but you're also writing into the local NVMEs. Um, and then the second lump, you see it's a bit smaller um, and you've got this NVME lump there and no network lump, which means you're reading it all from the NVME drives and you're not taking anything across the network there. Um, so this is quite a lot of work, maybe, um, maybe 18 months in total, we already had some features which are a bit like this. We just sort of optimize them for this um, multi-epoch training in particular. For you, by the way, I haven't got a clock here, so you might want to tell me when there's five minutes left and I'll, I'll speed up. Um, you're about at time. <laughs> sorry, was it? You're, you're, you're on time. Okay. How do you know? How do you know how many slides I've got? <laughs> I don't know how many slides you have. <laughs> Okay, I think maybe I can do the rest in five, 10 minutes. So. Um, okay. Uh, so that's Hot Nodes. Hot Nodes is so it's a client side um, automatic read caching. And then the next thing we did, in fact, we did this before, but we did Hot Pools. 
um, which is at scale um, management of data across Flash and HD. So this is all storage side stuff. Essentially, it means, and obviously, a lot of our customers just deploy all Flash. Um, but when the volumes get very large, it becomes rather, you know, economically prohibitive to do that. And some of our customers say they've got uh, hundreds of petabytes. Uh, so, in, and that's that's going to stay the same. Um, so, whichever Flash you choose, it's still another five years or so, um, five or six years before the price per terabyte um, kind of maybe starts to equate. And who knows? You know, you know the um, environment out there isn't actually ideal for for chip manufacturers to reduce costs at the moment. Um, but anyway, the point is with this hybrid environment of Flash plus HDD has still got quite a life left in it. Um, and so we built hot pools to manage that. And essentially applications always write into Flash and that's a big Flash layer. So it could be a petabyte or several petabytes. Um, and then in the background, what we're going to do is we're just going to move that data back and forth between the Flash layer and the HDD pools. And the HDD pool is probably going to be five, six, maybe 10 times what the Flash pool is. Um, so it's a background activity. Um, you always write into Flash, then we'll watch that data. And if it's hot, it'll stay there. If it's not hot, we'll move it down into HDD. And if you have data which you're accessing regularly in the, in the HDD pool, we're going to promote that into Flash. So this background activity is going to move data back and forth. Now, the, the fun thing here is this is just one namespace. There's just one file system here. And so there's no real penalty for accessing the data from HDD. The only penalty is you're waiting for the HDD spindle rather than the, the flash to respond. So it's a, it's a low penalty kind of HSM mechanism. So all the benefits of HSM without the downside. And the downside of HSM has always been, you know, these two tiers are too far separated. Um, here, they're not separated at all. It's on one namespace. We're using internal native um, data management to move this data back and forth. Um, so it's really rather efficient. Um, and of course, actually what happens is um, these pools, these pools are connected, and you move data backwards and forwards by simple commands, um, APIs. But our, honestly, in most of our customer environments, they already know exactly which data data set they're going to be reading, and they can just promote it themselves. So they don't really need to rely upon this automation often in traditional AI. Um, but we have it if they need it. So not related to performance and stuff, but one thing that comes up a lot, and actually at Cambridge it came up too. Um, uh, is multi-tenancy. And there's various ways of doing this, um, but within our exascalar system, we essentially um, can export sub-partitions of this very, very large namespace into different tenants or groups. Um, we can do it in multiple ways, but the most simple way is um, each group essentially has a Kerberized or shared secret key. And if they have that key and prove that they are the tenant they say they are, then they can mount this subdirectory of the file system. And they can't even mount anything else in the file system. So it's kind of a lot stronger than POSIX um, in terms of segregating logically and partitioning the data whilst keeping the performance benefits of a very large system. There's a bunch of other security things, but we have found, you know, with the value of this data um, and obviously the applicability into particularly life sciences, then keeping these things partitioned is of increasing importance. Okay, so I was going to just finish off a little bit with uh, just one very brief comment here is we do have Kubernetes support. Um, um, it's not often used, actually, so the... Um, the uh, Kubernetes environment tends to be very transient here. The fact that we can provide persistent volumes is often managed elsewhere. Um, but if people want it, it's a very, very performant implementation of these uh, persistent volumes for uh, Kubernetes. Uh, the other fun thing which I wanted to mention is the, um, the ability to do workload analysis. Uh, so one of the, again, is also pushed by one of our AI uh, vendors who have been developing this fairly rapidly is uh, they want to be able to see who's doing what on these systems at any point in time. So you can actually bring up the GUI um, and the GUI will tell you which application is consuming what amount of metadata and throughput on the system at any one point in time. So it's kind of cool. So it's often with a file system, you don't know. Um, you just, somebody calls you up and say it's slow and you don't know why. Um, but with the DDN systems, at least you can uh, have a look on the GUI and say, oh, um, Bob's running this ridiculous job that's created 10 million files in one directory. Um, I can see it on my storage system is, is telling me that. Um, let me just come back to these questions here. Oh, we'll come back to the questions at the end, I guess. Um, 
And then the other thing is what I wouldn't dwell on was, you know, fundamentally this is a parallel file system and that means it stays quite simple as you scale it. Um, uh, and this is a critical importance because as I said at the start, these customers often don't know how fast this data is going to scale or what they're going to need. So being able to just add add chunks one by one without any backend networking and kind of stuff is, is quite quite nice. And it's a parallel file system that gets you that. It's the, the intelligence and the client that allows you to do this very simple scaling model. Right, I had one little other thing. I only put it in here because we've recently done this. Um, NVIDIA did launch NVIDIA AI Enterprise. It's essentially, I guess it's, it's AI for softies. It's AI for people who want to use VMware and keep that VMware environment have a bit of an easier route rather than move on to Kubernetes. Um, we did do some tests the other day. Um, we used a, a, a system we have, which probably this, people in this call don't know about, called the IntelliFlash. And essentially what that does is a different sort of storage that supports VMware. Um, but the nice thing is you can essentially support the virtual machines, which are running your AI workloads. Um, you can support and export the NAS shares, which might contain the um, model parameters for your AI systems. And that might be shared with Windows Workstation. So it's a NAS, it's a SAM. It can support VMware. And it's quite nicely complementary um, to the, the main DDN systems. So we now have these kind of solutions, which are primarily what I've been talking about is A3i. It's these parallel file system based systems that you see at the top of this rack. Um, but we've recently sort of introduced these multi-protocol storage systems, which um, help you build the whole environment. So including support for containers, support for virtual machines, support for NAS components, support for data movements into clouds and back of, out of clouds, and then also support for disaster recovery and, and, and backup and archive. Oh, right, I think that was it. No idea what time that is, but I'll stop the share and look at these questions. Thank you, James. Yeah, we do have a, a double question here. Uh, question one was, how does hot nodes know when to write to local cache? Ah, very good question. And the answer is very simple. It does, it, it will, it will always write the, the reads into local cache. And then there'll be a process which watches that cache for activity and expels data that isn't recently used. Um, so essentially, uh, it'll always write and it'll then release files and purge files out of that cache. Uh, based on activity. And the second question was, why decision for Lustre rather than Spectrum scale for AI storage? Oh, very good question. So, of course, we have historically used both. Um, uh, the one advantage for Exascaler or Lustre-based system is, you know, the client was much more amenable to putting into these environments. Um, there's had to be a lot of work on the GPFS side here, but the Lustre client doesn't require, doesn't need to see all the other clients. Um, and th there's been a little bit of, you know, it's just an architectural choice, but it meant that when you deploy GPFS clients inside these containers, it got rather messy because they all essentially have to know, know about each other's presence and talk to each other. Um, there's client interactions involved in GPFS, which doesn't happen in Lustre. So when out of the gate, we were able to focus on integration into the GPU rather than sorting out this um, kind of problem. Um, so the containerization of the Lustre client was much, much, much easier. And I think that's essentially given us a fairly big head start in doing all these other things we've been talking about here. So at the start, a couple of years ago, it was just a much, much simpler client um, to put into these container environments. And since then, there's been other optimizations. The other one is MMAP. Um, so Exascaler has a much stronger MMAP performance than uh, GPFS, um, and that's been quite historical. They have improved a bit, but I think uh, Lustre still uh, beats um, uh, GPFS by quite a long mile when it comes to MMAP performance. Great. Thank you. Thank you, James. We yes, appreciate thanks. your presentation today. My pleasure.